we are, sorry I didn't have my mic on, we are uh, again delighted that you're here with us watching uh, and again whether by YouTube or Facebook, we are believing that uh, this Easter there's going to be more people in the world that are hearing the gospel message than ever in human history. So what we're going to be doing today is we're, uh, our worship director Alan Taylor is going to lead us in a few songs. Uh, I will read a passage out of Matthew 28. If you have your Bible and want to follow along, I'll be reading out of the New International Version about the resurrection. You know, we talked about uh, Good Friday two days ago and, you know, the, the death and the burial of Jesus. But hallelujah, today is Resurrection Sunday. And, you know, there's a tradition in the churches around the world for really to back to Jesus' time where they would greet each other on Easter morning and they would say, Christ is risen. risen and the indeed. people would say, He is risen indeed. And so, Father, right now, we just thank you, God, that uh, today is Resurrection Sunday. Lord, it's the day for us as believers, Lord, to shout from the rooftops that Jesus is alive. Lord, we do pray that every church in the world, Lord, would echo that cry, Jesus is alive. And Lord, we thank you for people all over the world giving their lives to you, Lord God, in, uh, in the beginning of this end time harvest that we believe that we've entered into. God, we just give you praise for your blessing on our service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There's a place where mercy reigns, never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flows deep and wide. For all the love I've ever found, like a flood comes flowing down at the cross at the cross I surrender my life I'm in all of you I'm in all of you where your love ran red and my sin washed white I owe all to you I owe all to you, Jesus. There's a place where sin and shame are powerless. Where my heart has peace with God and forgiveness. For all the love I've ever found Comes like a flood Comes flowing down Oh, at the cross at, I surrender my life I'm in all of you I'm in all of you Where your love ran red and my sin washed white I owe all to you I owe all to you Here my hope is found Here on holy ground Here I bow down Here I bow down Here arms open wide Here you saved my life Here here I bow down, here I bow. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you, I am all of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you. I owe all to you. At 
At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in awe of you. I'm in awe of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you. I owe all to you. I owe all to you. I owe all to you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, Savior of the world. Jesus, Savior of the world. Jesus, Savior of the world. Thank you, Alan. 28, in the New International Version. After the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him and clasped his feet and worshiped him then Jesus said to them do not be afraid go and tell my brothers to go on to Galilee they will see me there the guards report while the women were on their way some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priest everything that had happened when the chief priest had met with the elders and devised the plan they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. The soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews even to this very day. Now we come to the Great Commission. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some still doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Isn't that good news, folks? That's the gospel. It's that Christ died, was buried, was raised to life, and he has commissioned us as his church to go out into the whole world and tell them the good news that Jesus is alive and he wants to save everyone who turns to him. And so we just invite you. We're going to go into a second song, our last song this morning, and uh, then I'll have a message to uh, start out our new series. The moon and stars, they wept. The morning sun was dead The Savior of the world Was fallen His 
body on the cross His blood poured out for us The weight of every curse upon Him One final breath He gave as heaven looked away, the Son of God was laid in darkness. His body in the grave, the war on death was waged. The power of hell forever broken. The ground began to shake, the stone was rolled away. His perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated. Forever He is glorified. Forever He is lifted high forever he is risen he is alive he is alive the ground began to shake the stone was rolled away his perfect love could not be overcome now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated. Forever He is glorified. Forever He is lifted high. Forever He is risen. He is alive, He is alive. We sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah. The Lamb has overcome, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah, the Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb is overcome. Forever He is glorified, forever He is lifted high, forever He is risen, He is alive. Is alive forever. He is glorified forever. He is lifted high forever. He is risen. He is alive. He is alive. Forever, Lord, you're glorified. You're lifted high, seated at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for us because you love us. We know that through history and other accounts that you were seen after the crucifixion risen and alive by over 500 witnesses. It only takes two to make something credible. We thank you, Jesus, 
for your death, for your blood that washes us from all sin. Your love ran red. My sin washed white. We thank you for your resurrection, for your defeat over hell and death itself. The sting of death has been removed. The power of the grave has been broken because of what you have done. We thank you, Jesus. And forever we will praise and glorify your name all the days of this life and through eternity and beyond. Thank you, Jesus. Good morning and welcome to the bridge. To stay connected and receive current church updates via text message, please text the word FALUT to 97000. Once you receive a welcome message, please send a text with your name so that we may save your information to our database. If you would like to give to the bridge, you can choose one of four ways. By cash, check, text the dollar amount to 850-203-5520, or online at bridgepensacola.com. And lastly, for details of all events, go to bridgepensacola.com and scroll down to the events section. My ruins, resurrected. God, this is the end. You can't tell me you can make the dead in me come back to life. Everything turns to ashes but without the hope of revival. Imagine living with faith in God. I can't get back on my feet. I stumble and fall, but I am too weak to make it on my own. So my only option is surrender. I throw my hands in the air. I give up. I ruin everything I touch. It's foolish to think that God can restore my life. Wait. God can restore my life. It's foolish to think that I've ruined everything I touch. I give up. I throw my hands in the air. Surrender is my only option. I'm too weak to make it on my own, so I stumble and fall. But get back on my feet with faith in God. I can't imagine living without the hope of revival. Everything turns to ashes, but you can make the dead in me come back to life. You can't tell me this is the end. God resurrected. So welcome once again, everyone, to The Bridge Online. Uh, if you're new, my name is Bobby Lepine. I serve as lead pastor here at The Bridge Church in Pensacola. And uh, we just want you to know, wherever you are gathered, you are a part with us of the eternal church. The church is not a building. The church is people. And so we welcome every one of you on wherever you live. Uh, we hope and pray that uh, this is going to be one of the best Resurrection Sundays in your life, not with the outward circumstances, as we'll talk about, but that inwardly, a lot of times when things outwardly are dark, as I'll talk about this morning, inwardly God can do his greatest work. And so, uh, you know, as I said in the beginning, Christians around the world and through generations have always 
welcomed each other on Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, and they would say, and I want you to say back to me, they would say, Christ is risen, and then the people would say, Christ is risen indeed. So let's do it again. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And so today, we're starting a, a new five-part series called Red Letter Day. Uh, we're going to be studying pretty in depth. I'm excited about it, but we're going to be studying pretty in depth the five things that Jesus said from the cross. And today we're going to be looking at the, one of the saddest things in all the things that we are going to be studying. We're going to be looking at when he said, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? And so before I go uh, into it, folks, I want to uh, take a moment just to kind of talk from the heart uh, about where we are. You know, we are in day 12 of April. Uh, you know, we, most of the world, as well as our nation, is in quarantine and, and uh, you know, practicing this new term, social distancing. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, there's, a, there's a heaviness that comes with it. And, is that, you know, again, as I'll talk about, many people have lost jobs and, you know, here in Pensacola with the hospitality industry. But, you know, uh, our president has been, came on two days ago and said that, you know, he's going to be making one of the biggest decisions of his life on, of when to open things back up. But we are believing in the body of Christ. We at the bridge, as well as thousands of churches across the world, we do not believe that it is an accident that we are right in the middle of Passover. Passover started last Wednesday, Passover week, and it will end this coming Thursday. And we don't believe it's an accident that right in the middle, this does not happen very often, right in the week is our holiest day of the year as believers, and that's Easter Sunday. And so what we're believing for, folks, is that today, today, and I want everybody out there who's watching on YouTube, Facebook, and here, let's say today, today, today the shift starts and the mountain goes down. We know that mountain slope that was going to go up. We're believing that today it starts to go down. And so anyway, folks, uh, again, we're going to be praying this week uh, for our president as he makes the decision. Uh, I also want to say a big thank you to those of you at the bridge who call the bridge your spiritual home. I uh, want to thank you so much for your faithful support. You know, many of you uh, have been giving online, and uh, thank you. You know, we could not do what we're doing. The bills still have to be paid, um, you know, doing ministry, doing this. But uh, I want to encourage those of you, because we have about 50% who, you know, give on site, give by check or cash. And I just want to encourage you to try online giving. You know, I know a lot of times, you know, people can think, Oh, I don't know, you know, privacy, blah, blah, blah. Listen, our uh, system is totally, totally secure, and you can have confidence in it. The simplest way is to go to our website at bridgepensacola.com and go to the giving portal. They'll ask for your, it'll ask for your name. If you want to make it a recurrent gift, you can check that off as well. And then, again, at the end of the year, you know, we have our giving records uh, that go out and so it's anyway we just want to thank you and uh, again let me just say uh, finally before I, we dive in um, listen if you're watching this morning or tonight or this afternoon or tomorrow uh, I just want to encourage you that if you do not have a church home you know where you are known and you know others where you are cared for, where you know, you know your leaders. I believe with all my heart that every believer needs a pastor. And so I just want to encourage you, if you are disconnected or maybe lost in the shuffle you know, of mega church world, I don't encourage you to leave your church. But listen, we would love to have the opportunity 
to be an online church for you where you can be prayed for uh, and we're going to be rolling out some things in the next two weeks where you can really get involved in the Great Commission that I read about in Matthew 28 a few minutes ago. And so if, if you're not a part and you would like to be a part, just let us know. Message us, you know, let us know in the comments and uh, we just appreciate it. So guys, we're going to uh, pray and then we're going to dive in. Father, right now, God, it is an awesome thing, Lord God, that millions upon millions of your people right now around the world are celebrating the greatest event in human history, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, we're so thankful today that we can, can live the resurrected life. We can live out of newness of life as we put our faith and put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we can be filled with resurrection hope. And God, that's what my prayer is today as I deliver this message. I pray, Lord God Almighty, that the people that are watching, the people that are listening, Father, that they would be filled with resurrection hope. And Lord, we just give you praise for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name I pray and amen. Well, guys, a few minutes ago, uh, between songs, uh, I read out of Matthew 28 about the resurrection, the Great Commission. And so what I want to do as I start out this particular message is I want to go back one chapter, and we're going to go back from Matthew 28 to Matthew 27 as we look at this first thing that Jesus not just said, but cried out from the cross, why have you forsaken me? So starting in verse 37, it says, they placed the written charge against him. It said, this is Jesus the king of the Jews. Now let me say, they were dis put that above him in a mocking way because, you know, he, he proclaimed that he was a king and that his king was not of this kingdom but of another kingdom. But they were doing it in a mocking way. This is Jesus, the, quote, king of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. In a few weeks, we'll be studying that as well. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who were going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. Now again, they're quoting Jesus because he claimed he said, I'm going to destroy this temple, and it'll be built in three days. What he was speaking of wasn't the physical temple. He was talking about the temple of his body, but they didn't get it. So they're hurling insults at him. And then it goes on, and it says, in the same way, the chief priest, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him as well. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of the Jews. Let him come down now from that cross, and we will believe in him. And the next four words, I believe, are at the very heart of their mockery. And they said, he trusts in God. Let's all say together, he trusts in God. Again, he trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he had said, I am the son of God. And so what they're basically saying is that you claim to have this special relationship with God as your father. And you know, if, if God was really your father, you wouldn't be where you're at. You wouldn't be hanging from a cross like a criminal. You wouldn't be bloody and beaten and so, you know, last night, my wife and I uh, watched The Passion, which it's a hard thing for her to do, but last night she felt like she could do it. And it was interesting because, you know, I've been reading over this again and again, 
and the different reactions from different people, from the crowds to the, to the religious leaders, you know, all the way through to his disciples. And, you know, as I was watching The Passion uh, last night, you know, I was thinking to myself, how would I have reacted? Seeing this man who claimed to be the son of God, claimed God as his father, claimed to be God come in the flesh, how would I, if I was there, how would have I have seen this? How would have I have felt this? And you know, it was interesting because literally almost the whole movie, uh, my Robin was just bawling. I'm talking about heaving bawling. And she just went, I don't understand why you're not crying. And I said, I said, I'm taking it all in. And I really was. I was taking it all in. And I was thinking, you know, if I was there, how would have I reacted? Because now it's easy to say, oh, I would have, you know, I would have beaten up, you know, uh, Judas. I would have, you know, I would have, you know, come to Jesus' side. You know, we look in the rearview mirror because it's history. But, you know, in reality, folks, I think we'd be surprised how we would have reacted. And, you know, just seeing the movie last night again and just seeing, and Mel Gibson did a phenomenal job, unlike anything ever in movie history, of portraying the suffering, you know, what's called the passion of Christ, you know, when he was arrested, he was betrayed, first of all, by one of his closest disciples. He was beaten, he was mocked, you know, he was abused, he was whipped to the point where the Bible said in uh, Isaiah 53 that he was actually unrecognizable as a human being. That's how beaten he was. And, you know, then they take the crown of thorns and they hammer it into his head and, you know, having the nails go through the wrist. They had it in the hands, but it was through the wrist and through his feet. You know, I again was just thinking, dear God, you know, what would I have done? And so, you know, it made me think about, because it says here that, you know, the, the religious leader said in a mocking way, oh, he trusts in God. You know, let's see what God's going to do for him if he's really this close to God. The word trust, it's interesting, in the Greek is the word pitho, P-E-I-T-H-O. And it means to convince, to rely on with certainty, to have full confidence, complete trust. And so what they were saying is, oh, so you are still, you're still that confident in your God. Even though all this has happened to you, you know, you still think you can trust God. And you know, I, it made me think about going all the way back you know, to the temptation that Jesus dealt with in Matthew 4 with the devil who took him up to a high mountain, said, you know, basically it, the whole questions were, if you're the son of God, if you're the son of God. So this thing is really demonic. It's Satan himself still trying to get Jesus to go off of his mission. His mission was to take on the sins of the world to bear the cross, the suffering for humankind's sin, and to purchase salvation. So the devil, through the people, is mocking him, telling him to come down off the cross. And you know, again, I was just thinking, you know, about how easy it is to trust God when everything's going well, you know, when everybody in the house is healthy, when you've got that secure paycheck you can count on, there's enough food in the cupboard, you know, in the cabinets. You know, life is good. You have the vacation once a year. But it's easy to trust God in good times. But it's so much harder to trust Him when life goes dark. You know, I shared a couple weeks ago about an experience I had in 2006. And uh, in 2006, in, in May... I literally, you know, was in on a mountaintop, had had just some great uh, ministry wins, and just things were going great. And literally within one month, you know, from, from May 20 or May 10th till June 10th, I went from the, from the mountaintop all the way down to the valley of despair. And, you know, I was 
just thinking and remembering back, you know, how what had been simple before of trusting God because everything was going well became extremely difficult during that, it was a three-month period. And I can't tell you folks how much these questions went through my mind. Whereas before, I felt like I was on solid ground. I felt secure. I felt like the bottom had fallen out, you know, from me. And it's kind of like now in the world, you know, it's shocking. In one month, the United States went from being the, the best economy the world's ever known to 40 million, you know, millions of people filing unemployment and not sure what's going to happen next. But again, darkness has a way of driving us closer to the Lord. We don't get to know him, as Miss Melanie said last, two Wednesday, or last Wednesday. Uh, we don't get to know him up on the mountaintops. We get to know him in the valleys. And so, you know, for me in 2006, like I said, I was plunged into what is known as the dark night of the soul. And this is a very real thing, you know. Uh, the, some of the mystics coined it the dark night of the soul, St. John the Divine and others. But what is the dark night of the soul? I'll just read real briefly here. I read a description before I came up and I thought it was good. The dark night of the soul is a period of utter spiritual desolation, disconnection, an emptiness in which one feels totally separated from God. Those who experience the dark night feel completely lost, hopeless, and consumed with melancholy, depression, melancholy. Uh, the concept of having a dark night of the soul has existed for a long time, but the first written thing that we see of it is by the mystic St. John of the Cross, uh, not divine, St. John of the Cross. And so traditionally, the dark night of the soul refers to the experience of losing touch or feeling like you've lost touch with God and being plunged into the abyss of, of emptiness. The modern understanding of having a dark night of the soul is uh, feeling, again, out of touch with the divine, feeling betrayed or forsaken by life, having no solid or stable ground to stand on. And you know, my wife has said that many times in, in you know, her times of trial, so many times in her life, she just felt like when things were just starting to go good, the rug got pulled out from under. And you know, the, the dark night of the soul, again, folks, is something very real. But what I want you to get is that, is that, you know, there will be times of testing in the darkness. We can't pray away the season of the dark night of the soul. And I can tell you, I tried to pray my way out of it. Bottom line is, it's the Lord who leads you out of it and you learn things. You get to know God in a way you did not know him before in the darkness. So speaking of the darkness, let's finish up our text. So Matthew 27. Verses 20, uh, 45 through 46. So, it says, From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, which is three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Elwa, Elwa, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus had endured all the abuse, all the scourging, the whipping, the punching, the crown of thorns. He had endured everything and never said a word. The Bible says in Isaiah 52 that like a lamb led to the slaughter, Messiah would be. And he didn't utter a word until that moment when God the Father withdrew his presence and at that point he screams out why why father he did not understand and we likewise when we go through the darkness we a lot of times don't understand as well and we find ourselves asking that eternal question that Jesus asked which is why everybody say why why? Say, why God? Why God? 
Why God? And so uh, I have a little video of a few people who have gone through the dark night and have suffered loss and pain and uh, their testimony. And so if we could go ahead and roll that. Hi, my name is Lisa, and in July of 2008, my husband and I went in for a routine ultrasound at 20 weeks, and we found out then that our baby didn't have a heartbeat. Hi, my name is Scott. About, it was the early morning I got a phone call, and it was about my grandson being taken to the hospital. He was my little buddy. He was he was the world to me. I have other grandkids, but, but Nova was he was special. Uh, my name is Deidre, and um, my father sexually abused me until I was eight years old. Um, and he also beat the living daylight out of my mother. And when we got there, and they had just had just gotten him resuscitated, they admitted him into the, his room and. And it was at that point that I was like, God, why? Why? He's not even three years old. Why would you take this precious boy? It made me feel betrayed by God. It made me feel dirty. It made me feel like God left me um, out there by myself. Um, and I asked why. Um, I couldn't understand why God would allow something like that to happen to me. It was about a week when, when he finally passed away. So that was the hardest thing that we ever had to go through. And it was the hardest point in my life. And I questioned and questioned and questioned why, why was this baby taken from us when I never got to hold him or kiss his face. painful as it is to hear those words spoken and those questions, the, the, the why, why God question. You know, to be honest, folks, not one of us will get through this life exempt from suffering. Every one of us are going to, if we haven't already, go through periods where we want to just say, why God? Why, why, why? But the thing we have to understand, and this is, I'm going into the heart of my message now, the thing that we have to most is that much of what we go through in this life, we won't fully understand until we get to the other side. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. The truth is we only see part of the story. We don't see the whole story. We only see part. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12, he said, Now, everybody say now, now, at this time on this earth, now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we will see him face to face. Now, everybody say now, now I know in part, I don't know it all, but then I shall know fully even as I am known. You know, I was thinking yesterday as I was preparing this message, I was thinking about, you know, Job, you know, the book of Job. You know, Job is the heavyweight champion of suffering, if you want to call it that. Um, he stands as the biblical uh, model of, uh, of walking through suffering. But, you know, it's interesting because... You know, we know, because we can see the bigger story of the whole book of Job, we know that in the first two chapters, Satan is allowed, you know, Job is God the Father's son, and the, God is so proud of Job that he's a righteous man who loves him and serves him. But Satan comes and starts to accuse Job and say, oh, he's not, you know, he's not that great. Let me just do this, you know, and, and see what happens. And so Job loses pretty much everything, including his health. And then we see Job for 38 chapters 
asking the why question in some form or fashion. For 38 chapters, he is challenging God about why did God even allow him to be born. You know, and he says, I go to the east, I go to the west, I go to the north, I go to the south, but I don't see him. It's like we said that dark night of the soul. God just seemingly had disappeared in Job's life. And so 38 chapters, he's questioning God. And then all of a sudden, in the last two chapters, it gets flipped around. Rather than Job questioning God, God begins to question Job. And he puts him on trial and says, oh, really? You, you, where were you when I created this, that? The, where were you? Were you there when I was creating all these things? And basically, God never answers Job. You know, I'm convinced that Job went the rest of his life, just like I was saying about me in 2006. People say, well, what was that all about? I have no idea. I know I got to know the Lord in a deeper way, but with Job, I'm sure he had no idea until, because we see in part, until he got into heaven, where then he could, as Paul says, he could see fully, because he was known fully. And so then he understood why God allowed him to go through that, which we know is for our sakes and believers through thousands of years when they go through suffering. You know, it's the book of suffering. And it's like God was taking, he was so proud of his son Job that literally it's kind of like, he, it was like a trophy in the trophy case. It's like, Man, Job stands tall above. The book of James says, consider Job. Job is like the trophy of grace. He's the trophy of God. And, and, and the, the father was so proud of him. But again, folks, you know, we don't know. We know in part. And on this side, we can't fully know because only God knows the, the, the answer to the why question. So look at Isaiah 55. The Bible says this, Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9. It says, speaking, God speaking, says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my You know, I believe Job had no idea what God was up to. You know, he didn't have any idea, you know, that actually Satan was behind it. God filtered it and allowed it, but God had a purpose. And so, you know, again, folks, when we go through those dark times and we have no idea, you know, what do we do? And so what I want to do as we roll toward a finish here is I want to give three specific things that when we go through dark times, when we go through the dark night of the soul, when we go through those times where we do maybe feel forsaken, there's three specific things. I call them the three essentials that every believer needs to remember when we go through the dark times. The first one is this. I'm going to give you the three, and then we'll go back and do them. So the first thing I need to understand is that God is good. Everybody say good. The second thing I need to understand is that God is for me. Let's say God is for me. And the third thing I need to understand is that God is with me. God is good. God is for me. God is with me. Let's say it again. God is good. God is for me. God is with me. So going back to the first thing that we need to continually soak ourselves in is the first thing fact about God. The first fact about God is that God is entirely good. When we see him revealed in the Old Testament to Moses, he says, I'll let my goodness pass before you. Whenever the priest would go before the people and, and the, the Levites, they would be shouting, he is good, he is good, and his love endures forever. When we come to the New Testament, you know, we see in James chapter 1, verse 17, speaking about the nature, the character of God, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, from God, and comes down 
from the Father of lights comes down to us on earth with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. There is no variation. He does not flash back from good to bad. You know, that's how the pagan deities, you know, they had to please these pagan deities with, with all these things just to try to make them happy. But no, God is always, always good. There's no variation or shadow of turning. One of my favorite hymns, and I'm definitely not a singer, but I am a worshiper. And many times when I'll go for a prayer walk, and I might be feeling blue, I'll sing the, the old hymn. I don't know all of it, but it's called Great is Thy Faithfulness. And so I don't, probably some of you know it, but it goes like this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing. It goes, Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, O God to me Hmm. and folks that is the bottom line is that God is entirely faithful he is entirely good and that's the first thing the enemy tries to do when we go through trial is he tries to slander with a black paintbrush slander God's nature that God is good. And that's what he did with Jesus. That's what he did with every person, every person who walks with God. He tries to, at some point, slander, paint God's character as not being good. But I want us all to say together, what's the first thing we need to remember? God is good. And instead of asking the why question, we need to learn to ask the where question. Okay, why question isn't going to get you anywhere because we only know in part. But when you ask the where question, then you're getting in and say, God, where are you working? What are you doing? Listen, I have a saying, there's always mercy in the mess. And you know, God is always, just when, because we get in a mess, our temptation is to say, why God? God wants us to say, okay, what now, God? Where? What, 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 what's the next step? I'll give you an example. Just yesterday, this is fresh off the press, I uh, you know, had to do, prepare for Good Friday service, so had a late start on my Sunday message, Easter message, and so it's a quarter to five, and the optometrist that I go to to get a contact put into my reading eye was closing in 15 minutes. And so... I'm ha ha. I'm 80, 79, but I'm boogieing down, and all of a sudden on I-10, I hear, kadunk, kadunk. and I look back, and I think, man, did I leave my trunk open? And all of a sudden, I feel the back tire, literally, it's just blown out, and I'm like, oh, God. I'm first of all trying to control the car, and I'm thinking to myself, my first thing was, why, why, why now? had to get back to prepare my message. You know, this was ruining my whole night. And I just, you know, I resisted the why question. And I said, Father, because this is something I know, guys, is that God, God exists. He lives outside of our, our circumstances don't define God. He lives outside of them. So I, I said very quickly in my mind, I said, Father, what now? And I'm thinking, should I pull over on the shoulder? get a tow truck, God only knows, you know, what that's going to mean as far as getting home, getting this done, Uh, is there even a tire place open, and I felt in my spirit that no, just go slow, like five miles an hour, so mercifully, remember, there's, write this down, there's mercy in the mess, so a guy in a big truck comes behind me, because I didn't have my, I couldn't find the flashers on the car, uh, the emergency lights, 
And so he comes behind me and he kind of nurses me with his lights flashing uh, to Pep Boys. And so Pep Boys just so happened to be, they were closing in five minutes. And I, I begged her, I said, listen, I'm a pastor. I've got a message to preach tomorrow morning. I've got to somehow get a tire, you know, just put a lo- anything on just to be able to get out. And she said, all right. And so there was no mechanic there. So she literally, this lady at the front, uh, changed the tire herself. And so, you know, it gave me the chance, though, to go across the street. You know, I called up Opti Club, which is who does my contacts. I called them up. And they said they would wait for me. So I go across the street, get my contact put in. I come back and literally 45 minutes total for the whole event. And, you know, I thought to myself, man, number one, if that would have been a front tire, or number one, if that would have been Robin, thank God it was not Robin. Not that women can't drive, but I'm just saying, thank God that was not Robin. Second, thank God, Lord, thank you, it wasn't a front tire. That could have been disastrous. Then, thank God for the truck driver who kind of nursed me to Pep Boys. Thank God. I was there five minutes before closing. And so again, folks, we, instead of asking why, we have to train ourselves to say, what? What now, God? Or where, God? Where are you working now? Where, do you, where are you leading me? So everybody say, not why, but what? Okay? And so, you know, as I said, folks, God is not equivalent to our circumstances. So you know, I want you to write this down. God does not equal my circumstances. And so, you know, it's easy for us to insert our circumstances in front of God. And what ends up happening, if we can put up the picture of the eclipse, it's like a solar uh, eclipse or, I don't know, lunar or solar. But our circumstance can block out God's goodness. And that's when the enemy works to cause us to question God in his goodness is he the circumstance you know whatever the circumstance you may have gone through a divorce or be going through one you may have like one of the ladies lost a child on the video you know you may have lost your job and and are not sure where your next paycheck is going to come from but your circumstances are apart from God just like that son He's behind them. And just like if you were to see a, through a telescope the big picture, the sun is so much bigger than that little circumstance that's hiding the goodness of God. So everybody say again, the first thing we need to understand, God is good. The second thing we need to understand, and I'm going to move faster here, is that not only is God good, but say it with me, God is for me. God is for me. God is good, God is for me. Romans 8, 31, the Apostle Paul writes this. If God is for us, who can be against us? He he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? And so, you know, folks, we so often live as uh, spiritual paupers. You know, in reality, we're princes. We're princes with God. We're joint heirs, the Bible says, with Christ Jesus. Everything in Christ we have access to. The wisdom of Christ, the love of Christ, the patience of Christ, the joy of Christ. Everything that Jesus has in him we have access to as well. And so a lot of Christians live out of a deficit mindset. What they don't have as paupers, spiritual paupers, rather than an abundance mindset. You know, that man, I have everything I need in Christ Jesus. And let me tell you something, folks. I've learned to, to let favor, the, the favor of the Lord go ahead of me. You know, As believers, we have this thing called favor, and God is going ahead of us. Look at Psalm 5, verse 12. There it says in Psalm 5, Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. 
You surround them with what? Favor as with a shield. Psalm 84 verse 11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows, everybody say, favor. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing. Let me say that again. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. And so, again, folks, we, we need to remember when we go through the darkness that, first of all, God is good. Second of all, God is for me. And third, that God is with me. And so, Hebrews 13.5 says this, God speaking, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. That truth goes beyond your circumstances. Whatever you know, you're going through, and one of the things I've learned to memorize and pray, and prayed probably a million times in my Christian life now, is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. If you haven't memorized this, please do so. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. That means looking up and saying, Father, I'm walking with you. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. That is a promise, dear believer. God will make your path straight. Look at what 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, you know, you may ask, well, Pastor Bobby, why did God the Father forsake his son? And I believe the answer is found in this verse, 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says, God made him who had no sin to become sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so every sin in humanity that ever would exist or will exist or did exist in that one moment of time was poured upon that sinless soul of the Lord Jesus Christ that had never experienced sin. And in that one moment, the Father had to look away because His holiness could not look upon the sin and in that moment, Jesus felt what he had never felt before. He felt detachment. He could go through all those, the abuse, the physical suffering, but spiritual separation, he couldn't endure. But he endured it for us. He, we call it the great exchange. Uh, and, and let me just tell you what the great exchange is. Because through Jesus' obedience to the cross, we are enabled to not just go to heaven, but listen to this. The great exchange goes like this. Jesus took my sin. I, in turn, get his righteousness. You can write 2 Corinthians 5.21 for that. Jesus took my sin nature. I, in turn, get his divine nature. If you want reference, 2 Peter 1.4. Third, Jesus took my diseases. I, in turn, get his healing. Isaiah 53, verse 4 says, By his stripes we were healed. Matthew 8, 17. Matthew writes as he's watching Jesus heal the sick. And he says, Thus was fulfilled what the prophet said. He himself bore our infirmities. So there's physical healing in the great exchange. Fourth, Jesus took my poverty. And I, in turn, get his prosperity. Not just money, but prosperous in soul. Write down 2 Corinthians 8 9 for that. And then finally, Jesus was forsaken so that I could be accepted by God. You can write down 1 John 1 3, or it's actually 3 John 1 3, where it says that I wish that you would prosper in every dimension, even as your soul prospers. And so, folks, this is the gospel. The word gospel means good news. And the good news is 
that Jesus bore our sins at the cross so that in turn we, by faith and trust in what he already did, what was finished on the cross, when we look away from ourself and our filthiness or our perceived goodness, but look away to his, his holiness, to his suffering, to his resurrection, we in turn gain his righteousness. And that, again, is good news. And if you're writing on your outlines, the bottom line is our God is a redeemer. So wherever darkness is working, wherever, like I said, there's mercy in the mess, wherever there's a mess in your life, whatever you're going through, be it financially, be it relationally, be it physically, be it anywhere you can look in your life, the bottom line is, is that when things go dark, and they will at times, your God is a redeemer, and he's working good out of evil situations. Just like this coronavirus. You know, it frustrates me to no, no limit when I hear people say, well, God sent it as a, as a uh, judgment on America. Well, hello, not just America is going through this. We always are so self-centered as Americans. And so what we're going through is everything. And that means that, you know, that God's judgment. Folks, listen. When, when the disciples asked Jesus about, you know, the tower falling down on people and killing people, Jesus basically just said, stop asking stupid questions. Look into your own heart and find where you need to repent. And so, folks, that's the, that's the word of the hour, is that, in this season, as we're trusting God, that just like with the Passover, you know, the death angel passed over those who had the blood of the lamb on their doorpost, that, the, that, the, that this coronavirus is going to pass over, even starting today. And so we're believing for our Redeemer to begin to really, really amp up the work. I want to finish with a two-minute closer video that follows up to the story we saw with those who had the why question before and did not understand why God had allowed them to go through such suffering and now see them on the other side. I grew older and um, in 2004 I was able to go on a mission trip to Honduras and um, in, some, in my prayer time in Honduras I, was, I prayed and was still asking God why. Um, and I felt like God revealed to me that he allowed that to happen so um, a passion could be birthed inside of me for students, for youth, for young people. We struggled with the why and um, questioned and God showed us throughout the whole process that he was with us and that he, he was holding our Isaiah when we couldn't. <laughs> But it was during the time when we knew that he was going to leave us, that he was going to, to go be with our Father in heaven, that we knew God was in this. We, we, we knew it was. But it was, it was difficult to get to that place. We, we really wanted him to be healed. But we, had, we began the process of accepting that God was God and God is good. I would never choose to have my father abuse me but uh, by God allowing that to happen um, I'm able as a survivor I'm able to tell my students that they too can forgive they too can survive they too can be healed um, and live with our true father because of that man I can experience the love of my true father my heavenly father a love that is pure and unconditional after trying for a year and a half after losing Isaiah, um, we found out this past Christmas that um, I'm pregnant. And um, I have a peace about this pregnancy and that's something that I feel that God has shown me and um, put on my heart and he's been faithful and he's good. Good, always, always good. God is for you. He's always for you, never against you, and God is with you. Father, we thank you for this Easter Resurrection Sunday. 
God, we thank you that you are God. We are not. And there's so much in this life that we will never understand. But we choose to trust you. Just as your son Jesus chose to trust you in the darkest day of his life. Father, we choose to trust you that you are indeed always good. You are always for us, never against us. And you are always with us, walking, taking our hand through the journey of life. Oh God, we worship you this Resurrection Sunday. And we're so thankful, so thankful for what you've done, what you're going to do. I want to pray right now, if you're watching and you've never uh, surrendered your life to Christ, I can think of no better day to make a full surrender the best you know how to Jesus being the King, the leader, the Lord of your life than today, Easter Sunday. And so if you're out there and you know you've been watching and you feel something, you know, you feel a drawing to God and you, you know, you feel like you've been separated from God, but you feel him drawing you to him right now. I want you just to simply pray this prayer wherever you are, whether it's in your living room, your bedroom, where outside, wherever you are, God's going to meet you. He promised those who come to me, I will never cast away. So you can be sure when you come to God in simple faith, he's going to receive you. So pray with me now. Lord Jesus, I come to you right now. I come to you as a sinner who is in need of mercy, who is in need of grace. Jesus, I thank you that you took my sins 2,000 years ago upon your body. Lord, our, my sins were placed upon you. You took my sins. And I thank you. I thank you that as I turn to you now in simple childlike faith, I am forgiven. Lord, thank you now. I ask you to come into my life. Holy Spirit, fill me. Give me the hunger of a newborn child to receive and to read and to devour the Word of God. And I just thank you that from this point forward, you are the leader of my life. Show me where I need to go to church. Show me what I need to do. Show me step by step. Lead me every day, every moment, every hour. I, for it's in Jesus' name I pray. Everybody said amen. Amen. Well, folks, listen, we have been honored to be with you. Uh, we're thankful that you chose to spend time with us this Easter Sunday. And uh, I want to encourage you. You know, when I first gave my life to the Lord, I had a King James Bible. And woo, it was difficult. It was so hard. Uh, I, and I remember the New International Version came out, and I was like, oh, thank God. Well, there's the New Living Translation, which is my favorite translation now, because it's got the accuracy of the phrasing, but it also is spoken in our language in a way you can understand. I encourage you, if you just gave your life to the Lord, buy, go on Amazon, wherever, there's not many bookstores left, but buy a New Living Translation and start in the Gospel of John. And every time you read, simply say, God, I want to know you. Let me see Jesus. I want to know you. You don't have to pray anything more. Start reading and read as long as it holds your interest. Put it down, start the next day or in the afternoon. I promise you though, you're gonna grow. Listen, we're here for you. Like I said, if you uh, have any prayer needs, please let our hosts 
know online. Uh, you can private message. Uh, we want to stand with you and pray for you. So as we finish, I always like to finish with the pastoral blessing. And so I want to declare those who are here inside, those of you who are online, if you want to open up your hands, just simply put your hands by your side. This is just saying, I surrender and I receive. May the Lord God bless you and keep you. May the Lord God make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and your families. May the Lord God turn his face, his favor, and give you his peace. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We always like to finish. We say, he who finds God finds life. God bless you folks. See you hopefully Wednesday at 7 o'clock.